first, Jim O'Sullivan, the Chief Executive of Highways England. He was appointed in July this year. He's a chartered engineer. He spent his career with a transportation, asset management, and utility organisation. He was previously managing a director of Heathrow Airport Holdings, from the BAA, and at Edward Airport. So Jim O'Sullivan first. Ladies and gentlemen, please introduce Jim. It's uh, good to be here. I hope nothing I say is overturned by the Chancellor's almost head of the I think it's good to be The first thing I would say, and the most important point, is that uh, one of the perceptions we're now creating is that it is actually a strategic road network. Uh, we link all of the, the nodes in the UK, and uh, the regional growth is, uh, is promoted by national connectivity. So uh, you know, that is a key point. Uh, this map on the left, our version of the, uh, the tube map, is actually very much how we see this road network. It's living, uh, there will be roads that join it and come into it as economic circumstances change, and indeed there will be roads that local councils consider to be, or transport councils consider to be more theirs than ours, and there will be roads that leave it too. Well, Highways England is a very different uh, organisation to Highways Agency. The state up of the company was a, a huge landmark, um, two very simple things. Um, we've had to go to car to the company's house, and we are now subject to safety regulation by health and safety executive instead of um, Crown Essential. So these are fundamental um, changes that bring discipline to our organisation. Highways Agency had a very good reputation. It had a good reputation for road delivery, for road operation, and for safety. Um, and these were things that we wanted to make forward to Highways England. However, um, when I arrived and looked at this going concern, doing a good job in the road there were three areas I felt we should change and move forward on. Worker safety was not top class, but worker safety was less than the average of most of the companies working for us. And what I mean by that is actually companies working for us, major construction companies, if their workers were working on other projects, they were safer than they were working on highways in the So one of the first things we did was we told those companies to go away and bring experts in from other areas and their work operations. I did one interview uh, in the press, the headline read, New Chief Executive of Safety and Public Customer Service. And I kind of looked at it and I thought, that's up there with a dog bites man. And what Chief Executive does is for safety and front of customer service. And it kind of gave me an insight into where we were and um, how our industry thought. The other one that stuck me is that somebody could bring a fully maintained truck onto our roads and it can catch fire. We have to close the road, resurface it usually. It takes about 10 or 12 hours, and that's acceptable. And yet to put a rolling road pump in place, and so you travel down to 30 or 40 miles an hour, so we can put two miles on the road for safety without the road, it wasn't. So I really, really couldn't understand how those sorts of decisions were being made. And we've got a major focus now on safety. In terms of customer service, we've kind of drawn a division in moving from public service to customer service. Actually, they're both very close. But in my mind, the public service is that you turn up when you understand your problem, and the public service decides what you need, and they deliver it. So hospitals and schools, I think, work that way. You walk in, they decide what the needs are, um, and they provide you with the service. Customer service is about understanding what your customer wants, as well as what your customer needs. Uh, and that's going to be quite a transition for us. You will have noticed some of the things that we are changing. Um, Customer feedback told us that it's incredibly annoying to be stuck for 20 minutes in our roadworks and look up and see a sign that says something like uh, take care while it's home or stay alert. So we've stopped putting all those sorts of signs out in the network. Another relatively simple change that we've made is um, when you pass somewhere on the 25 or the 40 on the UDC, um, we say event um, the 10th to 12th of November and you wonder what that event is. And you wonder, so how am I to my behaviour to put the traffic on the right and down? We've stopped using it for the most part of the event. We will now tell you it's a pop concert, which probably means the most important business is probably going to attend a pop right next to the day. We will tell you it's a horse show, which as you know, you'll be slow moving horse boxes in the morning and evening. So we're trying to give you more information and less advice and tell you less how to um, live your lives. Um, so, so 
that's going to be most significant in this office of service. And finally, one that's probably most important to our um, reputation is the new learning principles strategy. There are, it's the biggest learning program program since the 1970s. There are 113 named schemes, so 112 named schemes in this package. Um, 70 of them have to be completed by, by 2020. We've already completed the first three. And uh, the other 40 must have started work um, prior to 2020, heavily into the design of those schemes. That five-year program, um, which the Chancellor has already committed to twice, um, and the five-year program that will follow it, give great stability to our, our industry. They allow our supply chain to invest in apprentices and in long-term kit. Uh, we are seeing major gains in productivity as a result of that. We bought one machine in, in the East Midlands for, and it cuts the grass and cuts the hedgerow at the same time. It's safer to operate, and it does the work in one night in two minutes will take a week to do. So these are the sorts of step changes we're seeing in productivity because we have a long-term program that allows us to invest in. We're already starting to talk about the 2020 and that is already 70% full with new road programs. Some of the current um, expressed interest on in, in my first few months in this very first was stack. Stack in Kent was implemented. Park lorries on the motorway close the motorway and divert the traffic onto the local roads should there be disruption at the channel ports. And back in July, we had disruption at the channel ports and we had disruption on the uh, Eurotunnel as well. Um, massive disruption. Stack has operated more times in July than it had been in the previous um, 10 years. I think it's possibly acceptable for a day or two days a year to disrupt North Kent in that manner. But to do it 20 times in one month um, is just not acceptable. The thing about Stack, which underlines the value of a strategic roads network, is Stack is a problem for the whole country. Service, I've spoken about. These are our pumps, safety serviceable network, our number one 
prosperity, um, is that you're safe, supporting economic growth, a free flowing network, Kirsty made reference earlier to the traffic company. Kirsty, this is not one of our roads, I'm afraid to say. Um, it's our responsibility of the Metropolitan Authorities. We are spending an awful lot of money on the environment. Um, I think that's important. We're going to address over a thousand noise um, sensitive sites. Uh, we are heavily into understanding all the nitrous oxide problems that have just emerged as a result of oxide and scanning the wind. And lastly, we have dedicated funds for cycle lanes, for communities, um, for what we call vulnerable users of building and things like right roads and cycle tracks. So we are trying to build these roads in a much more holistic manner. Thank you.
my team in delivering the role that we have. So now our role um, is the role regulator for the front room. Uh, we are the um, uh, health and safety authority, and we are the, we are the um, actually the railway inspector. So my colleague here actually uh, can prevent uh, trains and track. And that's the role we have. That takes about half of our office, actually. So that's a piece that you, know, you always need to bear in mind when you look at the size of our organisation. Um, we have a big team working on railway performance and economics. And they're the ones I really draw on very heavily when looking at some of the approaches we'll take. Oh, sorry. My team is going to be very small, it's going to be about 15 and we are virtually there, um, I've been recruiting uh, since, um, since March when I joined. So in terms of a sense of scale, we're not kind of creating this big, you know, kind of uh, economic powerhouse uh, in, uh, uh, in the centre of London. Um, you know, we are a very, very, very small, dedicated team of people who look at the highways. So, if you compare the round road roles that we have, um, I've, I've touched on some of these already. So, on the rail side, we have a, there's a lot more to us than just the economic regulation bit, the five year price control. Um, I've talked about the health and safety, we're a statistics authority, uh, we're a consumer and competition authority, we do track access and open access applications. So, there's a whole load of things we do on the rail side, some of which aren't applicable to uh, what we do on the roads. But you can see in the bubbles there, um, we do have a number of areas of overlap, particularly monitoring performance and efficiency. And if I boil down everything that we do every day, it's about monitoring highways in performance and efficiency. Okay? Alongside that, we're developing some expertise, so we'll be providing advice on future road investment strategies. Um, and that process is already starting. Paul O'Sullivan, who I think Kirsten mentioned earlier, will be out there later, uh, is already leading on this with the Department of Transport. Uh, and all of our organisations are part of that shape of the future policy. Um, I like Jim's uh, tune that picture so much that I borrowed it as well. Um, so, uh, in the context of road reform, you know, we're very clear, uh, and as I keep reminding my colleagues in the office, um, although it's only 2% of the road network in the UK, the strategic road network takes a third of the traffic and two thirds of the freight. It is a fundamentally important piece of economic infrastructure. So it, it justifies a huge amount of investment. That investment has to be both planned effectively and delivered efficiently. So uh, that's the kind of the core reason that we've set up, is to provide an independent view on that. Yeah. Now you may ask why, why do you need a monitor to do that? Have you had a department? Just well, yes, you have. Us. There are some Good things that an independent monitor can say more easily perhaps than the department would say. Uh, and I have to say, John Dowry, Steve Gooding, although you know the RC Foundation now, uh, Paul O'Sullivan, have had quite a clear vision about this to say that they need a body who is independent of themselves to give a public and transparent view of the performance of high rating. So that's what we do. It is very early days. We need to be flexible in our approach. We're still developing our approach. Um, and one of the things I would urge you to do is engage with oh, yeah, that yeah. So we have uh, started, you know, we're out and about, we're trying to understand the sector. I have a team of people, some of whom are highways engineers and some of whom aren't. Um, and we are trying to get up to speed and really understand the sector so that we can play our role as effectively as possible. So you know, it's an open invitation. Drop me a line, give us a call. If there's something that you think we can help you with and focus on, the talk to highways in the belt. Do, do come and get in touch with us. Um, enforcement and sanctions is a, a, something you'll hear a little bit more about um, as I go. Uh, not a big area of focus, but it is something we do have uh, under the statute the ability to um, enforce uh, our visit. Um, so I'll come and tell you a bit about what it's like to be a monitor. Um, because I hadn't done it before, so I came in and, uh, uh, and what was I struck by? Um, I, mean, I was struck by a whole bunch of very positive things. So people in the ORR work tremendously hard to make the right decisions, or at least very balanced, thoughtful decisions when we're regulating the rail network and monitoring Highways England. So there's an awful lot of work done. We're very evidence-based. So one of the things that Jim and I talk about <coughs> regularly is about data. You know, what information can we get to either 
uh, yeah, understand differences in approach, differences in outcomes from what, what was expected, or to support the view that Highways England is doing everything it can to deliver the, um, the outcomes expected of it. <clears throat> so we're very, very data driven. Um, we, particularly on the highways side, we need to be proportionate. We're not there to run Jim's business, absolutely not. We don't, that's not the role of a regulator. You don't actually get in, in place of the management team in Highways England. And we need to just focus on the things that really matter to road users. And areas that Jim's already mentioned that we're particularly interested in at the moment are um, road safety and the number of people killed or injured on the roads, um, user satisfaction, and I know Anthony will talk a bit more about what drives uh, um, some of those views, <clears throat> and then the efficiency with which the program is delivered. So those are kind of the three areas at the moment that we're really trying to bring to life. Um, I need to be joined up between road and rail, I've touched on that already. We're independent and transparent. And these are two tenets of any regulator. So we are not, although we are appointed by the Department of Transport, we act independently, we have a separate board, um, we're a separate corporate entity, and you know, we sit there and go, what is in the best interests of road users and taxpayers when we make our decisions? Um, we're forward looking, I'm gonna to touch on that in, in, a, in, in a slide or two's time. Um, and we really try our best to give robust advice to government uh, even when perhaps sometimes that, that advice isn't as welcome as you might expect. Um, and one of the things we're doing is, as I said, we're looking at the future as well, and we have started on that process of looking at RIS2. So one of the pieces of work that we're doing is, and we've just kicked this off, we had a, um, a panel of experts in our offices last week from a number of the uh, trade associations and representative bodies, is we're trying to assess, when we get to the end of the five, this five-year period, and start going into the next one where, you know, when you see some of the projections, the pace of investment will actually uh, at least plateau or get higher. Um, you know, is the supply chain ready for this? What are the warning signs that we should be aware of now? What are the measurements that we can take during the next three, four, five years that will assess whether we're going to be in a situation of an industry that is struggling to deliver? And as you'll understand, working the ORR, uh, we have some experience uh, of, of, of that kind of struggle at the moment. So we kicked off a piece of work. Again, many of your organisations will be involved. We have some consultants appointed to help us on this. And we'll be reporting back on this uh, in the first quarter of next year, where we give our view, our independent view, of how ready the supply chain is and what Highways England are doing to help the supply chain get there. Right. It's been a really busy year. Um, uh, uh, you know, my team are uh, a small team. We are busy getting up to speed. This year has been all about setting the foundations and building our understanding. Um, all our governance is in place now. We published our monitoring framework um, a, a couple of weeks ago. It's a riveting read, I can assure you. Um, we have an enforcement policy that was approved at the board yesterday. That will be published next week. Um, we defined our roles and responsibilities. Although I think a bit more work needs to be done on that. We're working on a baseline with Highways England. A lot of things, a lot of the real foundations are now in place. Our focus now is on building the understanding of me and my team of the sector. And that's what we're moving into. And we're piloting a few things. So one thing you'll see next week is our first six monthly report. Now that is intended to be the first publication to talk about how Highways England has done in the first six months. And I would urge you to read that one. That one's, a, a, you know, it should, it's intended to be a, an accessible read to stick to the, the kind of the high level issues that, um, that we've identified. And by the way, it'll be broadly positive about what Highways England have done in these six months because we recognize the challenge that they've been going through. And then next year, we'll be getting into more of the business as usual, um, working the issues through. I'm done. Thank you very much. Uh, just a couple of things uh, to pick up on there. You were very clear to say that the independent monitor can say things that the department can't. Like what? Well, um, how, do I, how do I put this in a way that uh, 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 doesn't come back to haunt me? Um, so there is, there is a, a, a kind of there's a triangular dynamic in this sector as there is in the rail sector, where you have the department and the ministers and the government who are very keen to move forward with projects and uh, the department who both serve the ministers as they should yeah. uh, and perhaps 
are therefore not necessarily always bringing it back to um, you know, exactly how efficient are some of the projects being proposed. Has, there, has, a, has a ruler really been run over those? Yeah. And that's why they look to an independent body to help them. But do you that. have the capacity, given the amount of work that's going to have to be done on the road network, and you say you're a small team of 15 and you don't want to be big and you want to be out seeing the M1 yep. and so forth, when there's so much work to be done, how are you going to ensure that it's not just a kind of you know, skating over the surface? Yep. So, so we've been very clear from the outset that we will focus on uh, the outcomes that Jim presented earlier. They yep. are a central tenet of the road investment strategy and the KPIs that go with those. That's where we'll focus a lot of our attention and we'll only get into more detail where we feel there might be an issue yep. or where we feel it will help us understand performance on those KPIs. On the investment program, the 112 schemes, we will uh, look at those kind of in the round. So we'll look at the different programs that go to make those up, so smart motorways will be one. Yep. We won't be picking on individual schemes and kind of delving into the reasons why a particular scheme is behind, unless we think it might be symptomatic of a wider issue. So we'll try and be very targeted and do it on a kind of a risk-based approach. Right, well, that, that's a good, very good point to come on to Anthony Smith, who's the Chief Executive of Transport Focus. Um, he qualified as a solicitor and worked for five years as a principal consumer lawyer for the Consumers Association, publishers of which, prior to joining Transport Focus, Anthony was deputy and acting director of the regulator of premium rate telephone services. Anthony, then, see how these two are going to work together and what your input is going to be. Right. Thank you very much indeed, Kirsty. Can I just check? Can you, can you hear me at the back? Could somebody just wave? Um, brilliant. Oh, that's great. Oh, hello. <laughs> there is somebody out there. It's quite challenging up the front here. There's a kind of plane taking off, as Kirsty said. Also, I've never given a presentation inside a bouncy castle before. This is quite a, it's quite a first. I would have brought the kids if I'd known this. It's, um, it's going to be interesting. Um, you're probably thinking, who on earth is this bloke and why is he here talking about highways and talking about road users? Um, it's a very exciting new world we're going into with roads, I think, as Jim and Peter have outlined. And we are part of the architecture of that changing. Transport Focus is the independent consumer watchdog for all of the users of the strategic road network in England. And I mean all. The government's been very clear about this. It's the motorised users and some of the people that actually walk and ride horses and all sorts of other things on and around the strategic road network. So we've got to represent everybody. We also represent rail users in Great Britain and bus coach and tram passengers in England outside of London. We're the independent watchdog. We're sponsored by the Department for Transport. We're very much at arm's length. They let us get on with it. And we try and bring a professionalised, consumer-based approach to what we do. We are a consumer organisation. We're not pro-rail. We're not pro-bus. We're not pro-cars. Our job is to stick up for the users of these forms of transport. Secondly, we are an evidence-based organisation. I could bore you with my journeys on the A3 and all sorts of other places, but it wouldn't really give Jim and others much information about driving their decisions on the strategic road network. We have to bring proper, decent, responsible evidence to the table to help drive decision-making. I think in the past, it's fair to say road users to a degree have been done to, um, rather than being asked what they think. I think some of the communities around roads have been you know, reasonably well involved in some decisions. I don't think users have been sufficiently well represented. That is not the fault particularly of any party, it's just a fact about the spending and some of the decisions that had to be made. Our job is to bring a new voice to the table. And thirdly, we aim to be useful. If we're not useful, there's absolutely no point in us getting involved in this work. We, we want to help people make better decisions on behalf of users based on evidence. So that's how we're going to approach this. You may have seen some of our work before, um, the National Rail Passenger Survey, Bus Passenger Survey. That's the approach we've brought to public transport. Road users, obviously, is very, very different. It's very easy to give a questionnaire to somebody going on a train. It's slightly harder if they're going up the M1 at 67 miles an hour. And so we've got to develop a new approach, and we're conscious the road network is very different to the other areas we work in. Open access, no payment at point of use, the behaviour of others has a very disproportionate effect on your, your experience and people turn up in all sorts of vehicles, as Jim said. So it is very different, so we're not rushing at this, we're going quite slowly. We're trying to build something that's going to be useful together with our colleagues and please today do come to our stand. We've got a stand here, come and grill my colleagues about what we're doing and what we're not doing and we'd like to see you all there. 
We've, we've dipped our toe into the research on uh, the strategic road network and users. And the first bit of work we did, which we've got copies of at the stand, is just asking people very generally about their experiences about the strategic road network to try and get an understanding of what, it, what does it feel like? What would these people like to be asked about in terms of their experiences as we develop a new road user satisfaction questionnaire? And what struck us immediately is the absolutely enormous diversity of people who you are dealing with on the strategic road network. Yes, you've got trucks. Yes, you've got vans. Yes, you've got cars. But drivers have an enormously different feeling of confidence and feeling of control in terms of what they're doing. And we developed this typology of users ranging from the invincible, cavalier, reluctant, nostalgic, seeing how people sense their experience on the strategic road network. Be very interesting. How many of you here feel you are invincible in your use of the strategic road network? And you know, be proud of it. Come on, put your hand up. Who's invincible? Oh, come on, be honest. Oh dear, that's very difficult. Who's cavalier? <laughs> oh, are you invincible or cavalier, Kirsty? You're cavalier, right? Who's nostalgic? Who harks back to the 50s and the A25? Ah, oh, we've got a nostalgic cameraman. And who's reluctant? Yeah, thank you very much. Oh, you're, you're a shy bunch, aren't you? But I think this, this underlines just how d this is a task that has to be approached very carefully by us and by Highways England, because when you're putting out information, when you're putting out cones, when you're putting out roadworks, you are dealing with people with enormously different ranges of experience and enormously different ranges of how they feel in control. And if people feel in control, by and large in life, they are happy. If they're feeling out of control, by and large, they are not happy. And I think Jim's job is to try and get as many people as possible feeling in control of what they're doing. Also, what we've done is key bit of work we always do in various sectors we work in is looking at priorities for improvement. Now, this chart is not a satisfaction survey. This is asking the current users of the strategic road network, what do you think is the key priority for improving? If the government had some spare money, God forbid, where would they spend it? And it's very interesting, this chart. It surprised a lot of people. The key priority for improvement, and the relative sizes of these triangles indicates how important they are, was the improved quality of road surfaces. And I think a lot of people thought, well, that can't be right. You must have, this is mad. You must be talking about potholes on local roads. We're not. We got these people absolutely focused on the strategic road network. They want the road surface improved. Now, I think we need to do some more work with Harvey's England about this to understand whether it's the, the joins where patches have been made, whether it's the M6 elevated section, or what is it that's giving this sort of feeling, whether it's when you go onto a bit of concrete, off a bit of tarmac, and the noise increases. We need to understand this more. I think, luckily for the government, a lot of its money is going to be spent in this area in improving road surfaces and improving the design of roads. But I think it's very important to remember in terms of developing the next five-year spending plan what, what users are saying. Did the same bit of work for HGV drivers. Same, same priority came out number top, improved the quality of road services. Interestingly, the second biggest priority was about better management of unplanned delays. And then we've spent quite a bit of time talking to the freight sector, understanding their needs. And an impressive industry, actually, I think, the freight sector, and so focused on just dealing with the network as they find it. If they're told about what's happening, if they know about the diversions, if they know what's going on, they will deal with it. The logistics industry is pretty impressive at that. So it's not surprising, perhaps, that came out second. In terms of current experience of users, and is this going to change? Oops, good grief. We did that priorities work around the country. Now, it's a bit busy, this map, but the main difference, and these are the Highways England areas we were looking at, the main difference was the M25. The M25 is viewed by users as a beast. It kind of has a mythical status. It's different to other roads. People avoid it. People don't like going on it. People have a different experience. And I think the journey time, the fact that journey times came up the priorities for improvement for the M25 area perhaps is no surprise. It is, a, it is an animal of quite different quality. Although recently, having been around Birmingham, having been around um, Manchester on, on their boxes, their version of the M25, that looks, looks pretty crowded as well. But interestingly, very little variation across the country in terms of those priorities for improvement. In terms of current satisfaction, um, it's interesting to look at what people are saying about their current experience of the strategic road network. This is derived from the existing Highways England National Road User Satisfaction Survey. You have to remember that. And you can see that the key driver of satisfaction with the current experience is, by and large, journey time. 
the key driver, the key thing that's dissatisfying people is unplanned delays. Now, th those are flip sides of the same thing, in a sense. And I think it's interesting to bear that in mind, is that the focus on maintaining journey times is important. Although I think, as you can see, that for most people, the experience, broadly, most days, is as they expect. What they don't want is the unexpected, the unexpected disruption, the delay when they don't know whether it's going to be 30 minutes or three hours when they're going to get out of it. Our key task in all this is to develop a new road user satisfaction survey, and we need to get a new name for this as well. And if anybody would like to come to our stand with a snappy new title for the new survey, I'll buy them a cup of coffee. Um, we have to develop a new survey by 2017, which will become one of the regulatory measures for Highways England. We're going to carry out the existing survey till then, and we're developing an online survey. We're trying to get people to fill it in as quickly as possible after the experience, because the longer you leave asking people about the experience, satisfaction drops very quickly. Ideally, you want to ask them, you know, kind of the minute after they've finished. We're going to build a panel, hopefully of about 20,000 people, all representative, all sorts of users, including truck drivers, and it will allow comparative benchmarking, additional questions. It'll all be online. It'll be a, a big, powerful sample, I think, and we can follow up some of those, those users afterwards. So key task for us, never been done anywhere in the world before. We must be absolutely mad to have taken this on, but we have. And I think it's become, going to become a very powerful driver of information in the sector. What next? We're publishing soon um, our report on HGV drivers' priorities for improvement. Again, I think a slightly unheard voice in this sector about what the drivers of HGVs actually think. We're going to be looking at roadside facilities and, most importantly, information. Road users' needs and experiences during disruption, planned and unplanned, and helping Jim and colleagues with that. And finally, just working towards the second road investment strategy and trying to get you, the user's voice into that. We will say something at some stage about safety. I'm not going to dive into that because we don't know enough about it yet, and it's a complex area, but clearly it's going to be important. But that's what we're trying to bring to this party. I think this is very exciting, this new era for the Strategic Road Network, and we're very keen to play our part. Thank you very much. So uh, just in terms of... Uh the relationships uh, between the three of you. In one way, they should be close, but in another way, they should be incri incredibly discreet because you each have completely different imperatives. And so therefore, how, in a way, as Transport Focus, do you make sure that you keep both um, Highways England and also the Monitor on their toes? I, I think it's, it, it's by publishing evidence and insight and research which people can see as credible and which reflects the experience on the ground. Our job is to hold up the mirror and say, this is what the users are saying. It's not a, we don't take the decisions, we're not the engineers. Our job is to hold up the mirror and say, this is what users think, this is what they're saying, what are you gonna do about it? And then poke them and say, what but are you gonna do? But everyone here, essentially, are, are the people that create the roads. So they're, they're the engineers, they're the architects, they're, you know, they're the people. What, how, how do you help them as well? I think, as I said, our aim is to be useful, and that, that usefulness derives from the evidence and from the research. Without that, it's a series of anecdotes. And what we aim to create is a body of research which everybody can use, everybody can feed off. And you may, you may disagree about the solutions, but at least everybody can look at the user research and say, yep, that looks right, we ought to do something about that. Well, actually, take, take, take the roadside facilities, for example, on a, well, motorways and a roads, for example. I mean, if there's a radical change in that, I mean, you would see consumers as wanting something completely different in the next five, ten years than they get just now. And obviously, the quality is so hugely variable. So is, is that quite a big focus for you? Because as people undertake longer journeys, they want rest places, they want all sorts of different things that they don't get just now. And they want safety in these places. Yes. I, I, it's interesting because it's an area which we picked up in doing the work with HGV drivers in particular. You know, a lot, a lot of the places where HGV drivers park up do not look or feel particularly nice or no. particularly safe in some cases. And given that the um, lorries are moving virtually everything that we have in this country, I think it's very important to focus on that and that freight sector also has got a recruitment problem. They have trouble recruiting people. Yeah. And when you see some of the places where people have to park up, it's not surprising. Now, there is, a, there is then a counter voice saying, well, what will people pay for? And that's an interesting issue because yeah. five quid puts a lot of people off. So you've but got that, to balance those things. Sorry, do we need these? They've all got mics on, though. Obviously, it's not working. Uh, 
yeah, I, I, let, let's talk about this whole idea of a pay model. The whole idea of a pay model, that's a big question. Well, I mean, you're talking about well, those kind of facilities, and so actually, if you potentially that's going to be the case. When we are living in the 21st century, we can't necessarily assume all these things can be free. No, I think if you're talking about road, <coughs> excuse me, if you're talking about roadside facilities, um, I think that's a question of, of Anthony informing us um, what people actually want, and yep. we're seeing a shift in that. We're, we're Okay, guys, we're going to, uh, can these, are these lapel mics working at all from the stage? No, they're not. Okay. Project. <laughs> Project or else I'm going to stick a very big needle in this tent. <laughs> well, I, and it, what, yeah, sorry. what people want, yes, in terms of roadside facilities, paying for them and so forth. This is something that you have to deal with as well. Um, not really part the of our of it, uh, turning right. Okay, we're going one last go. Yeah. Okay, so, so roadside facilities directly isn't part of our remit, uh, but it would come back through some of the uh, areas we look at, such as user satisfaction. Yep. So we'll be monitoring Highways England's performance against the surveys that, that Anthony uh, has talked about, and in particular the new one that's being developed. Yep. Okay, we're going to make an attempt now in the next 15 minutes to involve you, the audience, in this conversation. So what we're going to do is put microphones out. We'll, we'll keep one microphone, and let's hope we've got another microphone which can go around. We've actually got two more microphones. So we'd like questions, please, from the audience, because this is the first time these three have been together since the formation of it. So there's, there's quite a lot of things to unpick here about the relationships and what each is going to be involved in doing. So can I have the first question, please, and identify who you are? Yes, gentlemen, right in the middle. We're going to give you a microphone, but project anyway. Thank yes. you. Fire away. Hello. Um, my name is Jeremy Damrell from NACE. My question was to Peter, actually. Two of your slides referred to stakeholder engagement. And my question is what you saw your role as ORR was in relation to stakeholder engagement. So, um, OK, that's a good question. Um, so, so our role is to get as much uh, information uh, as much of an understanding of what's happening in the delivery of the road investment strategy as we can. And we do that in a number of ways. So obviously, we get a lot of information from Highways England. We have a lot of discussions with them. But that's only ever one part of the picture. And so one of our challenges is to, is to make our evidence, if you like, richer and more rounded when we're presenting it. So, um, you know, I, I could give you a good example. Um, you know, we sat down with the RAC. There's a KPI on... Uh, the percentage of incidents that are cleared after one hour, that's something we focus on. Um, their point was, well, you can't lose sight of the fact that incidents that may take longer than one hour to clear, if, if they become ever longer, then the, the impact on the users on the network can become uh, a, a problem, even if, you know, in hard and fast terms, the target is being met. So that kind of gives us the richness. And the way we do that is um, we have held stakeholder engagement events, we come to places like this, uh, you know, I, I'm out talking to as many uh, of the industry bodies as I can directly to su the supply chain. That piece of work that we did is very useful for that. We've actually got a benchmarking report that we've done. Uh, and again, that's allowed us to kind of get out and talk to people. So, you know, it is really about trying to get a, an informed view and not just looking at the, uh, 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 just at the data that we get presented, but trying to understand and interpret it. Jim, would you like to come in on that? I think uh, in one of the changes from Highways Agency to Highways England, we have become much more interested in what stakeholders play or say, sorry. Um, I'm thinking of about four years' time when the next regulatory period will be paid for by VED, Vehicle Exercise, Excise Duty or Car Tax, as most of you will know it. We're pretty convinced that when that happens, uh, road users will actually transform from being road users to being customers mm. and then they will become all the more vociferous in their comments and I think we've got about two or three years now um, to get ahead of the game on this. Great. There, was a, there was a hand up over here, can I just check where it was? So, yes, can you just wait till the microphone comes to you? Uh, keep your hand up please so that uh, the helper can see where you are. Thank you. Uh, Chris Jackson from Burgess Salmon. Um, when the rail regulator evolved to take on economic and safety regulation that was 
a recognition that economics and safety, public safety in this context rather than workforce safety, are two sides of the same coin. Well, we, 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 yeah. Sorry. Can you, can you just shout? Sorry. Sorry. I, I can relay Sorry. it actually because I might seem to be working. When the. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Right. When, um, when ORR took on safety regulation, yeah. that followed a debate that economics and public safety rather than work, uh, just workforce safety are two sides of the same coin. And if you're looking at integrated systems, particularly where you're looking at systems for smart work motorways and things like that, those parts, the economic and safety debates are fundamentally connected. To what extent is, do you think safety is already part of the remit? To, I noticed Peter talked about safety. And what extent do you think that public, or to the panel generally, that public safety part of the regulatory remit will evolve as do, this develops? Do you want to repeat the question because you yeah. heard it? So, so, so the question is around the, the, uh, the, the I guess, the ro our role in the public safety yeah. issues around the network. Um, so we do have a very different setup on the road side from the rail side. We don't have um, a direct health and safety uh, uh, statutory obligation, but we do monitor very closely Highways England's performance against its safety measure, uh, which is, you know, as Jim said, number one um, on the list of KPIs. Um, so our interest will be in understanding how Highways England views that question. I think, uh, you know, over the last six or seven years, there has been a general downward trend in the number of people killed and injured on the roads until the last two years, and it did step back up last year by a, a meaningful amount. And I recognise that Jim and his team will have challenges in reducing that number further. We will be very keen, and my board is very keen, to make sure that we focus on that as, a, as an area of particular interest. So although we don't have the statutory role to be the prosecutor uh, in, in, in issues of safety, we are certainly very close to the delivery of the, of the um, investment and the changes required to improve safety. Anthony, come in on that. I think it, you can't have this debate without talking about safety and everybody wants to see the safety figures going in the right direction which is down and it's interesting that the third biggest priority for improvement among car drivers yeah. is better behaved other drivers it's always other people of course because you're a great driver but you can't have this debate without looking at safety and of course safety and the consequences cause delays as well every time there's an accident it causes delay and that's a key driver of dissatisfaction so that is very strongly in this mix I think uh, don't be put off. Yes, one question here, one question there. Great, people are just going for it. <laughs> so let's try keep it really close to your mouth and yep, then just sure. shout as well. Hi, Steve Bagg from Soprasteria. Um, one question, you, you've mentioned um, improving information to, to road users and how that in, it, in of itself is a challenge given that people are travelling at 60, 70 miles an hour or possibly a bit more on the motorways. Um, I was just interested to know how you're in, uh, going to get that improved information, real-time information to road users. Jim. Okay, well, the first step in that is getting accurate data, and we're starting to move into this field of using mobile phones and, and other devices that people are carrying to know where they are, what speed they're moving at. The second is to get them into the likes of apps, um, and we're making this data freely available so that people who develop apps can make use of it. Um, those of you that own iPads will know that the mapping system shows you the traffic, and that's our data. The third, then, will be to start to work on predictive modeling so that we know what the traffic was like last Wednesday, the Wednesday before that, and the Wednesday before that, so that if you're planning a journey tomorrow at 10 o'clock on Wednesday, we can give you a fair guess as to how long that journey will take and to start then feeding accident and delay information into that so that um, yeah, updates. the difficulty with that is, is the very point you made earlier, that if you're driving, there's a limit to what you can actually access when you're driving without causing another accident. And, you know, it, this will end up being built into cars. Yeah. It will be built in, up into the same way as, as airline pilots have stuff in front of them that helps yeah. them um, land the plane safely. Yeah. In the same way, we will be enhancing your ability to drive your car safely. Yeah. Anthony. I think it's a very good question. You've got to start this discussion about what users want. Yeah. Because I think for so long, Highways England have been hobbled about what they can say to yeah. users. They are now the network operator, and they should be allowed to get on with it and experiment with different things and experiment with different signs and not have to get the DFT's permission to you know, yeah. try different things. And, uh, but you've got to start with what users want. Otherwise, there's a danger you invent something. You say, here's a fantastic app. Yeah. And everyone goes, well, that's not what we want. Yeah, well, and that's the point, that you guys can have a look at this. It doesn't have to go all the way to the department. 
Yes, and, and that, you know, the question earlier about, you know, what, what things can we say that perhaps the department finds more difficult. Um, I was struck uh, earlier this year, Highways England published their Biodiversity Action Plan, which was one of their KPIs, by the way, and they published it on time. And when, when I went to find it on the government website, it was, and this is no word of a lie, it was listed between, I think, Moldovan interpreter lists and something else completely, completely irrelevant to the road sector. And I thought that, that, that in a nutshell shows one of the challenges Highways England have had, which is being a little bit hamstrung by the Did government processes. Did you get that processes. sorted? Um, well, uh, not my job to sort it, uh, but it is, it, is, it is something we've spoken to Jim about, which is the transparency piece. And, and that is another side of the open data piece. By the way, I don't think Highways England necessarily are the best in the best place or the only place to develop the apps and use yeah. the data. And that's why Jim's talking about open data, because frankly, the people that will understand c uh, customer needs best and user needs best probably won't be Highways England. They'll have a great view on this. But I think the idea of getting the data out there for others to use, others to interpret and, and use on behalf of customers is really where this agenda should go. Uh, yes, there was a, a microphone request from behind with the gentleman there, please. And then we need the microphone over here. Yes. Good morning. My name's Dave Hill from Syslag and Joint Venture. Um, that gentleman stole part of my question, so thank you very much. Um, but one of the things I felt that's been covered is there's a strong correlation between good customer service and getting good value for the road user and it, getting information out, you've touched on that, but the VMSs, the variable message signs, the, you've got a captive audience and you've got a technology there, and um, I rather suspect you've underutilized what is fantastic. Video messaging of, on the road, sorry. Yeah, the digital yep. message signs. And I wondered, you've mentioned that you, you've used them a little bit more, Jim, in describing what type of event, but is there a plan to use them more readily going forward to communicate to the road user directly? Yeah, I mean, we've been working on a couple of areas here. Um, what people actually want is um, more accurate information. So there is a technical difference when we put it on a sign between long delay and severe delay. Um, if anybody knows that uh, difference, then I'll, ex I'll explain it later. It, it's unhelpful. Um, we have been a little risk averse in terms of what we put on those messages in terms of, well, why don't we put 30 minutes or two miles because it might be wrong, and in 15 minutes it might be wrong. So I think we've got some work to do in terms of that. We've just, we, we do use uh, customer panels, so we had about 20 what we thought were good ideas on, of things that we might put up there, uh, and when we tested them, they decided, our customer panel decided that only five of them actually were good ideas. Um, one that comes to mind is air ambulance on scene, that if you're stuck in a long delay and you know the air ambulance has turned up, there are a couple of things. One, you can feel some empathy for the poor people that are involved in whatever's happened. But the second is you know you're going to be there for quite some time. Um, so funny enough, that is something that, that customers have said they would find very popular. But we are trying to say, we're also trying to move to more geographic. Mm -hmm. um, not a lot of people know what, that a delay on the A423 beyond the A13 actually means. But if we can say there's a delay on the A423 near Isha, and I'm sure that road goes nowhere near there, but if, there's a, if we can say those sorts of things, people stand a chance of, um, of being able to work with the information we're giving them. Uh, th this is a complete layperson's question, but would Highways England ever think of having a radio frequency for information? Because that's the easiest thing if you're in the car. And if you're a real geek, you'd be listening to what else is happening in the rest of the country. Well, I think uh, possibly. I'm sure it's something that Highways Agency looked at at, at one point or another. We see it at the moment as being much more important to pass out the information to the local radio stations and then yeah. if you want to set your radio to picking up the traffic announcements yeah. you'll get them. Right we've got uh, luckily two questioners literally side by side. Your question first you've got the mic and then could you hand it over to this gentleman here. Richard Steinberger Highways England question primarily I think for oh. Peter. Um, the speakers mentioned that two percent of the road network in England um, belongs to Highways England, so according to my calculation, 98% are local roads. Who monitors local road performance in England? Uh, I'm going to have to get you to repeat that question. So, so the question, uh, which is very well made. See, I'm getting these guys to work a bit harder. Not only are they yeah. answering, they're doing the questions as well. <laughs> yeah, if I could just ask you a different question. <laughs> um, no, so, so the question was, uh, who monitors the 98% of the roads that aren't managed and operated by Highways England? Uh, and the very clear answer is, well, not us. Um, you know, that's not part of our remit. We are, however, very conscious of the fact that uh, 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 
in 99.99% of cases, people don't start or end their journey on the strategic road network. They start it on a local road network, and if there is too, uh, a disparity between their experience on one, uh, on, the, on the local network, as opposed to the SRN, then that isn't actually delivering for what end users of the network want. So we're conscious of that. Um, we're looking for the signals, and Highways England, I think, have done some, some good work on this. I know they're working, with, for example, with Transport for Greater Manchester to look at their, the impact of what they do on the wider network that people actually use, and so we would encourage that to continue. Um, and then we, we've also uh, done some work with them looking at things like uh, what their diversion routes are, which again is an issue when there, when there are either uh, planned or unplanned delays as to what is the impact that diverting traffic off of the strategic road network has in the local authority areas. So um, while we don't monitor that, uh, it is certainly an area of interest. And again, it's something coming back to a point earlier that was raised to us in one of our stakeholder events that we should not be blind to that issue. Okay, Anthony. Well, uh, they're, they're managed by local authorities and, and monitored through through their, you know, through, through what they do. That's a very good question. We, we, Parliament has asked us to focus on the strategic road network, but in the course of um, gathering data about the strategic road network, we will get lots of information about local roads as well. Yeah. And at some stage in the future, we will do something with that to be announced. Uh, I, just before we just go to, could you hand it back, please? <laughs> Hand, no, hand it back, hand it back. Uh, you seem really, really dissatisfied. Can you just very quickly, just so it's on the record, explain, very quickly. Well, it, you're just talking about network rail, for example, and you yeah. cover every railway and exactly. every route and every station, and you're only covering 2%, and presumably you know a bit about what's going on on the local roads, and there's no indication that anyone in the country is monitoring road performance on a local road yeah. network. Yeah, drivers don't uh, stick to local areas, so there should be some kind of, you can't just leave it to local authorities. I wonder what you think of that, Jim. If you... Well, I, th I think we have to um, look at the strategic road network through a particular lens. Um, you know, the government has taken a perspective which says that there are a small proportion of roads which are hugely important to our infrastructure. I made the point when I was speaking that regional growth is driven by national connectivity. So in the same way that one looks at the long distance rail network and in a, in a different way to local trains, one looks at long distance journeys in a different way to, to local journeys. The second thing is, is that having seen it as an instrument of growth, that these are important node to node connections, it's a completely different lens to the, st the, to the street that you live in. Um, having looked at it through that lens and decided to invest the amount of money that we're going to invest in increasing this connectivity and thereby getting the economic growth, um, it's right and proper that that sort of investment, you know, two to three billion pounds a year, gets the sort of scrutiny that these guys are talking about. And at the end of the day, it's your money we're spending. Yeah. Okay, questioner here. Anthony Oliver from Infrastructure Intelligence. Does the panel think that a move to uh, a road user charging system in the UK would be helpful in focusing minds on a customer, uh, or focusing on a, a customer-focused highway network? And I suppose, if so, will it ever happen? You mean individual lanes on motorways rather than actually whole motorways? Whatever, whatever. It's a, a, some kind of told, uh, some kind of road user charging to pay per kilometre used. Uh, it's a very good question. I think it's interesting it's looking at the M6 sorry. toll, which we don't cover, and also but the Dartford free flow, and seeing what what different sort of um, reaction that creates among consumers where they're creating payment at point of use. Um, clearly, it's not on the political agenda at the moment, but I think in the longer term, everyone kind of accepts that there's going to have to be some form of road user charging if you're going to manage the capacity. Yeah. Where and when is just a political issue. So should it, should it be on the political agenda? Um, I'm a consumer. Uh, I represent consumers. I don't think any individual consumer might well vote for it until things get so bad that it's a way of getting out of the mess. So, so when I was being interviewed for this job, uh, they said, well, what would it be like to be, you know, to be a regulator, do you think? Uh, and I said, I think there'll be some questions which uh, I have to uh, steer clear of because they're policy issues. Um, so that's the official answer from me. Um, unofficially, uh, you know, someone said to me before I, before I started, clearly an answer to some of the issues is going to be some form of road user charging. As Anthony said, it's clear to everyone that that needs to be on the agenda. Uh, is it on the agenda? I've also been told that um, 
uh, the first thing chancellors are told by Department of Transport, sorry, don't quote me on that, um, is, you know, we should have another look at road user charging. And they look at it for about a week and go, that might be a bit difficult, Minister. And, uh, and, and out it comes. I, I, I can't believe it won't happen at some point in the future. I'm, as far as I'm aware, there's no active policy debate on that at the moment. Um, j just before uh, we, f we finish, when, when you were talking earlier, I think you mentioned the possibility that what you will have is you will be able to have sanctions against uh, Highways England for failure to deliver. Explain to me about what sanctions would actually be and how they would affect people that are delivering for Highways England in the room if there are sanctions. I hope that's not going to be the last question because I'll be, I'll be finishing on a, on a note I don't, I don't really want to. Um, so we've written an enforcement policy. It's about to be published. What it focuses on is a number of stages by which we will initially raise and then escalate concerns with Highways England, many of which are very, very obvious things that you'll have in mind. So we'll write to Jim, we'll get their board in to talk, talk to our board. Um, we'll then look at whether or not we need to uh, formally ask for more information, formally uh, ask for a particular action plan to be developed, and then as a very last resort, whether or not any, any formal penalty needs to be applied. That's a whole other political issue, um, uh, but we, we, which I, I won't go to. But clearly penalties are you know, very much a last resort in our perspective. No one wants to go there, but clearly the whole purpose of having an independent body monitoring performance is that you have some, yes. in, you can apply some incentives to bring the company back to what we would consider to be the right level of performance. But just to be clear, uh, we shouldn't finish on that note because no, I think that would be a shame. To. We're not going to, but what I am going to ask each of you is personal achievement uh, in terms of the roads next year, what you want to do. And I'll come first of all, Jim. Personal achievement, what you feel you have to achieve by this time next year. Well, I think uh, it comes in a particular order. Um, the first is that we've done something about the safety and that the safety of workers um, is improving and the safety and we have a plan for improving the safety of road users so that would be the first the second is that the public starts to get it that the strategic road network is important and that they start to feel that we're providing them with the sort of service or at least that we're on their side um, even if we can't provide the absolute standards of service that we'd aspire to and the third is that we keep churning out these new road schemes um, to schedule and to budget Anthony. I th firstly, of course, it's got to be safety. The, the safety figures have got to be heading in the right direction. Secondly, we've developed a, road a new road user satisfaction survey that everyone agrees is useful and powerful. And thirdly, the government sticks to its spending plans and sticks to the plan. It's so crucial. Okay, so I'd reiterate, safety is absolutely the number one priority always. Um, in terms of kind of our contribution, I would like us to be seen as being an informed commentator uh, and reflecting the performance of Highways England in a way that you will not have seen from um, being within the department. And I very much hope that when I'm sitting here in a year's time that I'm commenting on a first year of performance which is generally viewed as a success and that, uh, you know, with Anthony's work, that the, the consumers, the, the road users actually support that view. As far as your work's concerned, will you be putting out regular updates, because it's all about the data you were saying, regular updates on your website about what you've done, what you've achieved, what you're doing next? Yes, so as I said, the first six monthly report comes out next week, do have a read. Uh, then we will do an annual report, which will be a, a, a bigger volume or a more, a more detailed volume. Um, and that's supported by a range of data um, uh, that we're collecting w uh, from Highways England, which we're going to publish because we'll have a view on it. But the great thing will be that everyone in this room and lots of other stakeholders will also form a view on it. And by publishing it, we get that debate happening. So that transparency is a tenet, central tenet of what we do. Well, could you please thank our panel for being so candid? Um, and for battling against a Force 10 and an early morning disco at some exhib exhibitor's uh, station. We must thank uh, Keir as the session sponsor. Um, Jim Sullivan is now going to hot foot it to Highways England board meeting. It's taking place within Excel, and he'll be back with the, on the keynote stage at 12.40. Now, I, I'll tell you why I finished five minutes early, because we're going to try and sort out this sound problem while you guys are all out there at the main stage because we have a panel session coming up and we want to make sure that everybody in the panel will be able to contribute and you'll be able to uh, contribute as well. Uh, so what I'd like you to do is to coalesce around the main stage for the uh, road minister's video address, Andrew Jones' video address, and also uh, the Department of Transport's road director, Paul O'Sullivan, is also going to make his speech from the keynote stage. 
So please make your way over to be there in about five minutes or so. Thank you very much indeed.